So one year ago, I stood on this stage uh, and I made an argument for this idea. Uh, if you're not looking at your data, then you don't understand your business and you almost certainly don't understand your customers. Uh, in more detail, my argument was that if all you do every day is look at summary statistics, in particular at time series plots of summary statistics, uh, things like the average page latency over time, then you were really missing out because you actually have no idea how your system really functions. Uh, because that summary statistic is washing away a huge amount of detail. Uh, and then I argued for the usefulness of histograms, uh, this very simple display that shows us the distribution of data behind a summary statistic. And I ended my talk last year with a story that went one level deeper yet. I talked about a time when looking at the raw logs was probably the best way to understand my customers and what they were experiencing. And what I want to do today is to extend the argument that I made last year. Uh, I want to begin by telling you the story of the London cholera epidemic of 1854. Uh, so this story uh, is, it revolves around an absolutely masterful piece of data analysis, which descends through my three levels. It starts out looking at high-level statistical summaries, and then it goes one level deeper to look at the distribution of data, and finally ends up with the equivalent of looking at the raw logs. And the story begins with uh, incredible population growth of London in the first half of the 19th century. In just 50 years, London had more than doubled to contain more than 2.3 million people. In the part of the city where the outbreak occurred, uh, people were living five to a room and population density was 422 people per acre, which is fantastically dense even by modern standards. Uh, and the problem is, of course, that they didn't have a modern sewer system, uh, which made London a fantastic breeding ground for cholera. So cholera is a bacterial disease that spreads through unsanitary drinking water. Once you're infected, uh, without treatment, you run about a 50% chance of dying, usually due to dehydration. Cholera came to Europe in the early 1800s. The first known case in Britain uh, was recorded in 1831. The first epidemic came a year later and by 1833 had killed 20,000 people in Britain and Wales. A second epidemic in the 1840s killed 50,000 people in Britain and Wales. And so by 1850, cholera had become the most important unsolved problem of its day. And it's important to remember that even though we had observed bacteria through primitive microscopes in 1676, there was no germ theory of disease. In the 1850s, people thought you got disease from miasma, from bad air. Uh, miasma theory held that there was some kind of poison in the air and that you got disease from breathing it. Uh, and honestly, this makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, people knew from mining, for example, that concentrations of toxic gases could kill you. Uh, and because they had no sanitary sewers, cities smelled really bad. Uh, and diseases like cholera concentrated in cities. And so it is totally reasonable to guess that bad smells cause disease. Uh, and in the 1850s, miasma theory was by far the dominant theory for cholera. Uh, but people, uh, there were people who had other ideas, which brings us to the hero of our story, John Snow. Uh, so by 1848, Snow had hit upon the correct solution to the puzzle of cholera. He had concluded that you get cholera not, uh, by ingesting it, not by breathing it. Uh, but sadly, nobody believed him. Uh, in 1849, he'd published On the Mode and Communication of Cholera, which uh, contained what may be the first large-scale epidemiological study ever undertaken. Uh, here's a map of London. You can see the Thames River snaking through the middle there. Each of the colored regions shows the area served by a given waterworks. Uh, and the thrust of his argument was that people living north of the Thames had their water piped in from relatively distant sources. But if you lived south of the city, your waterworks drew from the Thames at London Bridge, right at the center of the city, where raw sewage by the ton was being dumped straight into the river. And then he went on to go uh, through the records from the cholera epidemic of 1848-49, and he found that if you lived north of the river, your chance of dying from cholera was about 26 in 10,000. But if you live south of the river, your risk went up to 80 in 10,000. So this is fairly compelling evidence that's the, that cholera has got something to do with the water supply. This kind of evidence is a statistical summary of a vast amount of data. 
But as I said earlier, because of the dominance of miasma theory, this evidence was met with skepticism. A reviewer in the London Medical Gazette wrote that Snow's studies furnish no proof whatever uh, of the correctness of his views. Essentially, the reviewer recited, correlation is not causation, that most popular defense of tiny minds in the face of uncomfortable evidence. Um, the reviewer, however, did imagine an experiment that could settle the matter. Uh, the crucial experiment would be that water conveyed to a distant locality where cholera had been hitherto unknown produced the disease in all who used it, while those who did not use it escaped. And five years later, unbeknownst to the participants, this exact experiment would be carried out. On August the 28th, 1854, a five-month-old girl named Frances Lewis contracted cholera and while waiting for the doctor to arrive, her mother washed her diapers and threw the dirty water into the cesspit at the front of their house at 40 Broad Street. The cesspit was just a few feet away from an extremely popular well, and the cesspit wasn't properly maintained, so sewage from it contaminated the water of the Broad Street well. So Francis Lewis was the index patient, the source of the worst cholera epidemic in London's history. Three days later on Thursday, hundreds of people in the neighborhood had become sick with cholera. The first death was recorded at 1 p.m. on Friday, a tailor who lived at 40 Broad Street, the same house as the baby. By Sunday, nearly 300 people had died, including 80 within the last 24 hours. And by this time, word of the outbreak had spread, and Dr. Snow jumped at a chance to study this, the most important disease of his time. He lived less than 10 blocks away, and so he walked over and he drew water from the Broad Street pump and four other nearby wells, and he spent the evening and the next day doing chemical analysis of the water, looking at it under a microscope. But he couldn't find any evidence that cholera was present in the water, as microscopes weren't powerful enough yet. Um, and so on Tuesday the 5th, Snow went to the Registrar General's office. Since the 1833 epidemic, the Registrar General is had issued weekly reports of births and deaths in the city, including the time, place, and cause of death. And Snow asked to see the partial results for the week in progress, and he got the addresses of 83 victims. These addresses gave him very convincing evidence that the Broad Street pump was the culprit. So here's Snow's map from the book that he would later publish about the outbreak. This is Broad Street. Here's 40 Broad Street, where the Lewis baby lived. And here's the Broad Street pump. And each death is marked with a black hash mark. So you can see the concentration of deaths on, on Broad Street. So here's the full map zoomed out with Broad Street highlighted in red. But it's hard to see uh, on a screen, I think. So I made a, mere, a more uh, bare bones version. Here are the streets. This is the area that I was showing before. Here are the locations of the deaths. And now here in red are all of the pumps in the neighborhood. And so I hope at this point you'll agree that Snow had a pretty compelling case for the theory that cholera was in the water of the Broad Street pump. And he had this case because he had gone one level deeper than the summary statistics that he was looking at before. And now he was looking at the distribution of his data. Specifically, he was looking at their distribution in space. But he wasn't finished yet. Snow knew that miasma theory could just as easily explain this data, right? Maybe there was some pocket of bad air that happened to be centered on the Broad Street well. So to combat that theory, he would have to go to the equivalent of looking at the raw logs. Uh, he spent the entire next day walking around the neighborhood interviewing the surviving family members and neighbors of 70 of the dead. And in each case, he was able to establish a connection with the Broad Street pump. Take, for example, this cluster of deaths in the lower right. There are multiple wells closer to these houses, so how did these people become sick? Well, it turns out that these cases were children who went to school on DeFour's place, just off of Broad Street. And then there were people who should have gotten sick but didn't. An example is this brewery on Broad Street where none of the workers got sick. The brewery, it turns out, had its own well on premises and a, a private piped in water supply. But aside from that, the workers were actually allowed to drink a certain amount of beer each day, so they never drank water at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this kind of evidence really destroys miasma theory. If cholera were in the air, how could it pick and choose which buildings it infected? 
And finally, remember the crucial experiment of taking the water far away and seeing if drinking it made you sick? There was a woman named Susanna Ely who had lived for years on Broad Street and had developed a taste for water from the pump. After her husband died, she moved a kilometer or so to the north, but because she liked the Broad Street water so much, her sons arranged to have a bottle of it delivered to her on a regular basis. She had died of cholera on Saturday, and her niece, who also drank the water, died on Sunday, and there were no other cases of cholera in her neighborhood for weeks. And so the next day, Snow presents all this evidence to an emergency meeting of the Board of Governors of St. James Parish and asks them to shut down the Broad Street pump. And even though they were skeptical, nearly 500 people had died at this point and they had no other ideas. And so on the morning of Friday, September the 8th, the handle was removed from the Broad Street pump. And this was the first tenuous victory for what would eventually become the germ theory of disease. It would take another 30 years for the germ theory of disease to totally displace miasma theory, but Snow won the day in 1854 precisely because he looked not only at high-level aggregate statistics, he also looked at the distribution of data underneath those statistics, and he looked at the equivalent of the raw logs, and he chased down any anomalies that he found. And here is the lesson. When you really dig into your data, and you make the effort to track down and explain those weird outliers, you will often be rewarded. In Snow's case, tracking down the anomalies meant that he expanded his knowledge of the problem enough to make his theory bulletproof. So don't sweep outliers under the rug. Instead, seek them out and see what you can learn from them. So what does this mean for us, performance or, or, uh, or operations people? Um, what does it mean for us as we are looking at data like this or like this? or this? And what would it mean for us to act like Jon Snow? Well, so let's look at some data from the HTTP archive. Um, the HTTP archive was founded in 2010 by the illustrious uh, Steve Souders. Uh, and every two weeks, it hits a list of a couple of hundred thousand URLs, and it tracks all kinds of extremely detailed telemetry um, about how those pages are rendered. And one thing that you can do with this kind of data is look at statistical summaries trending over time, like this chart uh, showing the steadily increasing amount of JavaScript uh, on web pages. But we can also dig deeper. So this is the distribution of the onload event from the March 29th, 2011 run. Uh, this is back when the HTTP archive was only scanning about 16,000 URLs. Um, and uh, in case you're not familiar with reading histograms, the tallest bar on this plot says that there were about 1,700 URLs that loaded in between three and four seconds. And so now, if we want to be like Jon Snow, what we'd do is we'd start talking to individuals and these guys way out on the extreme seem like an interesting place to start. If we go and dig up the slowest URL out of all our 16,000, and you pop that URL into Pat Meenan's web page test, um, which will render that URL and record a ton of detailed information, what we find is that the slowest page is just badly broken. Uh, it makes 169 requests, which is a lot, but not completely insane. Uh, but the images are downloaded from 47 separate domains, which is kind of weird. I don't know why they're doing that. Um, when the page finally timed out after 60 seconds, it had transferred four megabytes of data. Um, when the page first starts loading, it pegs the CPU for four seconds. Uh, and then uh, the worst thing is that rendering doesn't even begin for 20 seconds. Right, like you're looking at a blank screen for 20 seconds. Um, and what if we look at the other extreme? What if we look at the fastest web page? Uh, uh, it's amazing, 186 milliseconds. This must be like super optimized page. This is gonna be awesome, or not. Uh, <laughs> um, this, is, this, by the way, is not a 404. Uh, this is what the author of this page intended to say. Um, uh, and so, <laughs> The lesson, again, uh, is that if you look at the extremes, you will often find things that are broken. Uh, if you go back and look at the logs for any system that you are responsible for, and you either dig out the fastest or the slowest requests, you will find all kinds of horrible brokenness. 
Um, the slowest hits will be tickling some kind of a bug that causes an infinite loop or some sort of deadlock, or maybe you've got an n cubed algorithm in your code that normally processes a list of five elements, but for some pathological request processes a list of like 50,000 elements. Um, or on the other hand, the fastest hits, uh, maybe some kind of runaway robot or some kind of malformed input that instantly crashes your server. Um, and so far, we've been looking at request latency, but we don't have to stop there. We can look at any continuous variable. We can look at things like bytes served or service calls made or CPU time consumed or log lines emitted, really any continuous variable you can think of associated with a request. Requests at, any ex uh, at the extreme of any of these dimensions will almost certainly represent failures of some sort. And once you're done looking at the fastest and the slowest requests, spend some time looking at the tail, this long string of, of relatively infrequent but slow hits. Um, and you should look at the tail because the requests in the tail are what happens when your system is under stress. This is what happens when you've got a garbage collection or when you lose your database connection or when a server just came up and is starting with a cold cache or any one of a dozen ways that your system is failing right now. You might say, well, hey, uh, you know, that's just normal operations. You know, sometimes servers restart and they have a cold cache and that's not a big deal. Uh, so I wanna argue that most of the things that are happening out in the tail represent availability risks. Uh, what happens when a huge chunk of your fleet all restarts at the same time? So can your backing data store handle the load when they're all filling their cache simultaneously? And if not, how is it that you're gonna get your system back up and how long is that gonna take? And what of this fellow, our old friend, the time series chart? Uh, so what if instead of average latency, we monitored something else? Uh, I'd like to suggest that you monitor percentiles deep in the tail. So what does that mean, percentiles deep in the tail? So we should talk about percentiles for a minute. Um, if we take all the requests and we sort them by their latency and we take the middle one, that's called the 50th percentile because half the requests are faster and half are slower. Uh, the 50th percentile's got a special name, it's called the median, and so in a sentence, if we say that the median latency is 267 milliseconds, then what we're saying is that half of the hits are faster than 267 milliseconds. And we can use other numbers instead of 50%. If uh, we look at the 90th percentile of this data, it's 533 milliseconds. So 90% of the hits are faster than 533 milliseconds. And if we continue, the 99th percentile is 850 milliseconds. And so at this point, you might be starting to see why it is interesting to monitor percentiles deep in the tail. With data like this, with a long right-hand tail, a statistic like the 99th percentile is exquisitely sensitive to changes in the shape of the distribution. Um, tiny, tiny changes in the shape of the distribution result in huge changes in the 99th percentile. And when your 99th percentile jumps like this, that is when you should go digging in the logs because that means that some new failure mode has just crept into your system. And that represents a new availability risk that you haven't thought about yet. And so you can either anal analyze that new failure mode now when everything is calm or at two in the morning when all hell is breaking loose. And just to bring it all back around to the story that I opened with, what Jon Snow found was that by explaining the anomalies, he was able to make his theory bulletproof. And similarly, if you look at the anomalies, at the extremes or the outliers in your data, and you take the time to explain them, you end up making your system more bulletproof, or perhaps I should say stronger and faster. So that's all I have. Thanks for your time. <laughs>